Hi, and welcome to City Scene with Mayor Mike Cahill. I'm your host, Walt Kosmowski. And your honor, welcome. Hi, Walt, great to see you. Great to see you. And we have a special guest that's joining us today, uh, Darlene Wynn. And Darlene is the city's director of planning and community development. Darlene, welcome. Hi, thanks for having me. Absolutely. And we're gonna be talking today about the city's master plan. And uh, this is something that the city started working on uh, oh, almost two years ago in, in spring of 2019. And uh, I'm gonna ask uh, either one of you can take this question first. Uh, uh, for those viewers who maybe are not uh, aware, what is a master plan and why are we working on a master plan right now? Uh, I'll start. Um, so a master plan is a long range plan that uh, includes a comprehensive analysis of all the aspects of community development. Uh, it sets forth a future vision for the city over the next 10 to 15 or perhaps even longer years. Um, and uh, under a set of goals, it establishes a set of recommendations to guide public policy and land use decisions going forward. Um, so it's, um, yeah, it's a very comprehensive kind of high level planning document that helps guide the actions of um, and policy changes and programmatic uh, implementation that we do in the next 10 to 15 years. Mr. Mayor, do you want to add anything to that? Sure, and, and as to the why now, uh, yeah. the, the master plan that we've been working with and it, and it was a really, it, it's a really strong plan that was, that was um, written in the early 2000s. I think it was passed in 2000. Or, but it, it's the bulk of the work and, and the master plan is really a, a conversation at a community wide level to take a look at, at all these key areas within a community, all the different values that, that a community holds um, and how to take stock of where we are and how to move forward. And so the plan that we've been working with, I, I remember being part of it as, as, a, as a resident going to all the workshops back in 2001, 2002, great product. The city has worked with it and leaned on it for a number of years, but it's time. You know, it, was, it was about 17, 18 years old. So it was time to, to kind of start and start again, go back to the community, really have all, all, the, all the great conversations and get input from every, every corner that we can. Uh, and, and you know, check ourselves on where we are and where we need to head. Now that doesn't mean that uh, everything that was in the old plan uh, is no longer valid. I mean, a lot of those things are still valid. Uh, what, what are some of the key changes in the, uh, the, the, uh, uh, the, the city and, and the kind of um, uh, 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 the points that you look at, that, uh, the key things that have changed that, that made you want to do this now? Well, I'll, I'll touch on that quickly and then let Darlene. Um, you know, what, one of the, one of the um, values that was set in the last master plan was a recognition that Beverly continues to need housing options for people um, and, and just how and where to provide uh, that additional housing. It was the case in 2001, it's the case today. Um, people in Beverly need places to, to live for all the various stages in life. Um, and so, and, and there are a lot of people in Beverly who worry about where their kids are gonna be able to live, if their kids, when they grow up, choose to live in Beverly. Where, where can their parents live when the parents sell the home they raised the family in. Um, so a lot of, a lot of you know, need around stages of life. And then there's a lot of need for housing in, in all uh, different kind of, all the different income levels. Um, so that's a piece of it. And that good thing is that was a value in the last plan and that was reinforced through all the public process in the new plan. Uh, and then another piece of it that, uh, that's you know, critically important and, and why we looked at it in the timeframe we did again, the plan was old enough, it really was just time in terms of best practices. Um, and also, you know, we continue in Beverly to always have to be thoughtful about where and how we can uh, accommodate new economic investment and growth. And one of the values that was expressed in the plan, which we're not surprised and it's, it's, not, a, it's not different from the last plan, it's really a lot of key values have been re reinforced and carried forward. And one of them is to ensure that to meet both of our both our economic investment needs and our housing needs, 
we try to, to look to reinvestment, redevelopment in already development place, already developed places rather than loss of further green space and undeveloped land to meet those needs. Darlene? Well, I think you hit on a lot of the points that I was going to touch on. Um, you know, we, to speak a little bit just quickly, in addition to the things that the mayor mentioned, um, you know, best practices have changed over time. Now, some of the things we talked about transit oriented development in the last plan, but we didn't call it transit oriented development at the time. Um, and policies and programs have changed enough and uh, the environment has changed. And so I think another area that we, we really looked at was sustainability. Uh, from an economic perspective, an environmental perspective, and a social perspective, and taking into account current trends um, with the environment, with um, social equity and diversity, and addressing um, you know you know what's going on in our world today, and making sure that our plan is responsive to that. Um, you know, maybe this might be a good time, uh, Your Honor, Mike. Maybe you could um, talk about some of the changes that have happened here in the. Beverly Planning Department uh, and give us an update on that. Sure, can I first ask, Walt, is your dog gonna get in the credits? He just, he just made an appearance. What's he or she's name? That's, that's Stella. <laughs> that's, we gotta get her in the credits. <laughs> 2020, Walt. <laughs> um, oh, that's great. Yeah, let, let me, if I could just, um, I, I wanna tell people, because a, a lot of people will, will remember and they may be looking for Aaron. Aaron Clausen was our planning director for six, a little, little more than six years. Um, and I want you to know he's alive and well and, and thriving. He's now the planning director for the city of Lynn. It was an opportunity in, in Lynn with a lot of exciting things happened that he couldn't uh, pass up. And we miss him. You know, we, we love him and miss him. We try to stay in touch. Um, but we also were, and he left in April. We're incredibly fortunate that Darlene was here already. And Darlene came in as our assistant planner. Gosh almost six years ago, five plus years before. Um, and, and so, you know, we posted the position and, 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 you know, went out and tried to get the best candidates. And oftentimes you have the best candidate right here. We were fortunate that we did and we recognized that. And so Darlene essentially was promoted to planning director back in, in April. Um, I, maybe she can fill you in on the rest of the office. And also Darlene, I wanna make sure you share with people a little bit of your own background so they can get to know know you and, and why we're so excited that you're running the, the planning department for us. Um, sure, I guess to start with that part, I um, I have about 18 or so years of experience now, I guess in, in planning, both in my education and, and practical experience. Most of that time was spent as a consulting planner working for um, various private companies that would go in and out of communities and work on um, planning projects and zoning projects and also a lot of um, permitting for development, um, the MEPA process in Massachusetts. I spent four years in Philadelphia or in the Philadelphia area working for a, uh, a county planning agency, similar role like a consultant to towns and cities. Um, and my master, I have a master's degree from MIT in urban studies and planning with a focus on environmental policy and my undergrads in architectural studies um, from Connecticut College. But um, I live in Beverly and I, um, I was lucky enough to um, find the opportunity about a year after I moved to Beverly and was really looking to move into the public sector um, and really, as I say, get my hands dirty and see a project through from beginning to the end. And this is a, you know, one of those experiences working on this master plan when you actually get to see something done and then actually implement it too, which is the exciting part. Um, and yeah, so, so because I moved up, um, thank you to the mayor for the opportunity to fill, jump into this position, which I've been very happy about. Um, Emily Hutchings uh, was recently in August promoted to assistant planning director. She'd been with the city for, I think, three years now um, and is, is doing a great job. And again, like the mayor said, you know, we interviewed other people, but the candidate was right in front of us. And then um, just last uh, November 30th, our newest associate planner started who filled Emily's position. So her name is Chelsea Zakis, and she's uh, actually moved up from Georgia, um, fresh out of Georgia Tech. And uh, she's she's you know, really enthusiastic and, and moving to Beverly in a couple of weeks uh, from Cambridge. So she's really excited and we're glad to have a full staff again to help us implement this master plan. 
Well, I must say that's wonderful. And just echoing the mayor's words, uh, you know, you having been around, uh, you you hit the ground running. Your learning curve was very, very short as far as <laughs> filling filling those shoes. Yeah. So let me ask you, uh, Darlene, what, um, how does this plan relate to all the other uh, efforts and plans uh, that the that the, in projects that the the city is working on? I mean, I, I just off the top of my head, you got the Bass River plan, the waterfront, you got Resilient Together, which I had happened to meet Emily Hutchings and work with her on some of the taping we did there. Uh, coastal resiliency, aging in Beverly. How, how do you how do you kind of meld that all together? Yeah, so the, the mayor mentioned this last night too in our planning board meeting uh, where we were reviewing the master plan. We have been fortunate in this community, even before I was here, to do a lot of planning, um, both through grants and through investment, um, you know, with um, uh, hiring consultants and or doing the work in house. But we have a lot of plans, like the ones you mentioned. We have a community housing plan, a hotel feasibility study, um, and all of those prior plans informed this master plan, but we didn't feel like, um, we didn't want to recreate the wheel and do, you know, create new work that we'd already done. So we think of them as an influence into the master plan, pulled out some of the key strategies and goals that the consulting team, we should say we had a consulting team, Util Inc., that really helped us with this master plan. Um, and then also looking forward, the climate action plan you referenced, a preservation plan that is just wrapping up and also a future equity audit. All those things um, will also be supplements to our master plan um, so that we have this overarching master plan that has some really high level goals and, and you know significant number of strategies, but it really does reference and base on all the other planning work that we've done. Now you, uh, at the very beginning, um, talk about Talk about how you decided what, how the process would be undertaken. What was your goal in, in, in setting up and defining how the process would take place? I can jump in this. I know, Marie, Mayor, you probably want to speak on this too, but I think the main priority and, and one, of the other, one of the reasons for doing the master plan at this time too was to get community feedback. And, and so we really wanted a robust public process trying to touch on as many members of the community, whether residents, businesses, institutions as possible. And so through that, we, we had 10 public meetings, three, workshop, three large workshops and seven neighborhood meetings, a number of focus groups with specific groups of people, um, two surveys that were done online, but also available in paper copy. Uh, and last summer, summer of 2019, I know Emily, Aaron and I, spent as much time as we can out, we could out at different community events, you know, working tables and, and getting out there to try and engage people who might not come to an evening meeting. Um, and so that was really, you know, one, one of the driving forces of just getting as much input and outreach and, and interactive outreach as possible. And you have, yep. there's a steering committee, right, composed of citizens, which I believe has a uh, uh, two, at least two members from each of the six wards in the city. Is that correct? Yeah, that's, that's correct. And also, um, uh, yeah, the master plan committee tried to also get a broad um, depth of representation of interest area. So based on what's included in the plan. Yeah. And, and you have, now you mentioned util, and there are a couple of other, you have some, a, a consultant team of outside folks Tell us about them and how, how have they been, you know, chiming in? How, what, what has been their role in the, in the planning process? Let me, let me go first, Darlene, on, yep. on that one. Just to, to first kind of fill out what she said in the last question. Uh, you know, we, we really put a high, the highest priority on community engagement in trying to write a new master plan. So, um, because our, our real goal was to educate ourselves and the community as to what the needs really are in Beverly and educate ourselves as to how the community's feeling about the way things have been going the last several years. So that's, you know, that's, that's been the highest of priorities throughout this whole process. And our, our consultants and others have said to us, you know, you, you people in Beverly do more community engagement and have done more in this plan than on any plan we've ever done in any other community. Um, maybe not ever, but I think, you know, we, we go beyond we went well beyond what would be expected. We, you know, we made a judgment, um, you know, last summer 
the summer of 2019 that well, the three citywide workshops were fantastic. The steering committee gave us great input from all around the city. The surveys, as Darlene talked about, all of the setting up tables and going to different, different events and then going to different community meetings. All of our outreach was great. And then we added on these seven neighborhood meetings, which we you know, publicized greatly and got lots of really you know, good uh, turnout and, 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 and really kind of heartfelt engagement and, and a lot of frank talk uh, with people. And, it, you know, it, it's helped us greatly because the values that people have that sometimes seem in conflict around, around planning decisions really need to be weighed and balanced and try to be made complementary. You know, we all care about the great neighborhoods in Beverly and we want our neighborhoods to continue to have that same kind of feel to them and those, you know, and we have a need for more housing and we have a need for more in the way of, of, of um, you know, local tax revenues. And we, you know, we all want to preserve open space. We, um, we want to make sure that the community is walkable. We want to make sure that there is a real vibrancy in our downtown and in our other little kind of neighborhood centers, like along the North Beverly Corridor and Beverly Farms, Rileside. So there, it, it's really about finding those sweet spots to balance those needs. Um, and it's, you know, we, we, we asked ourselves a lot of questions about, you know, as we tug on that question of how much more housing do we need? And we see, a, you know, a, a, a continuing need um, and it's gonna take some real work the question becomes, where does it go best? And you know, one of the values that we were able to come out of this with is a continued acknowledgement that, while it's not the only place to put housing, putting it within walking distance of public transit and within walking distance of some services and amenities that the downtown and these neighborhood centers offer is important. So I'll, I'll let Darlene talk about the consultants, except to say it's natural and really the norm that a master plan, you've got to go out to RFP for a consulting firm uh, to help you do all the work and kind of bring their expertise. And we got one of the best around and it's been fantastic to work with them throughout the last couple of years. And, and Darlene, maybe you can uh, touch a little bit on what ha have been some of the key primary findings through this process uh, thus far. Yeah, so um, we, high, as, as mentioned, we did an RFP process and had five, I think, I think four or five really strong responses. Um, but we were lucky that, that UTL had responded and they put together a team, um, including an economic consultant, landscape architect, um, trying to remember who else. We mainly did, our main coordination was with UTL and they were really the project managers and, and they, had, oh, and a transportation consultant um, that we had worked with previously, Nelson Nygaard. And they, um, the sub consultants all kind of worked behind the scenes, although they came and supported at some of the public meetings and really the, the UTL team, uh, consisting of Tim Love and Teskina Turin, and then a couple other members, uh, Jessica Robertson and Corey Berg, who have moved on, had moved on kind of throughout the process. They all were really our day to day, like, uh, you know, hands dirty team that we worked with intimately. Um, lots of meetings, lots of discussions, and, and really great feedback and great insight from them, too. And, um, and so, let's see, some, some of the key issues that we um, had identified, you know, I think we talked about housing need. Um, we knew that going in um, because we'd done the community housing plan, but, you know, that's a need that even during, you know, today is more and more, rel um, you know, relevant um, given the pandemic. Um, let's see, what are my, other? oh, well, the, having to deal with the housing, both, I think the mayor did talk on this a little bit too, but just addressing housing, not just from a, an affordability perspective, but a housing typology perspective um, with uh, the changing demographics in our city. So housing need um, for seniors and also for em empty nesters, um, ensuring that the city through uh, the initiatives that we put forth in the plan can ensure fiscal sustainability and continue to provide public services for the city that, that the city expects. Um, so that goes hand in hand with um, you know, additional development and making sure that um, we're targeting development in the appropriate areas, but also helping to meet the need for new revenue, new growth. Um, doing, let, me, let, me, let me jump in with this one yep. because I, I know it's, it's important to all of us. Um, when we talk about housing and the need for additional, there's a lot of time spent on design 
and density and scale and trying to hit that sweet spot moving forward as we, as we address those housing needs. So th those are also values that are expressed in the plan. And we should note that the plan is more high level, right? And it, it has a range of recommendations. And what's common with master plans are some of those recommendations lead to proposing zoning ordinance changes in different parts of a community. So the plan doesn't ensure anything to the extent that there would be some adjustments or changes in zoning needed to accomplish some of what's in the plan, those will have their own public processes. You know, for example, we're looking at that Bass River uh, waterfront and we're spending some time on that this winter and we're hoping to come forward with a proposal in, you know, by spring to make some adjustments to that area. But when that, you know, first of all, we're spending time on that. Um, second, when it does come forward, there'll be all kinds of opportunity for community involvement, and then the planning board and the city council have formal roles to play before anything would change so that we might try to implement one of those recommendations of the plan, which is to, you know, to look at an overlay to the Bass River as an example. Now, I, I did, uh, you sent me, uh, I believe it's on the city website, there is a, a draft uh, the, uh, dated November 13th, 2020. So it's very recent, less than a, about a month old. And is that available to look at on the city website, the, the one you sent me, Darlene? It is, yes. That's on the planning department page. It's also, we have a separate plan Beverly page that you can link to from the city website and it's on there as well. And that is largely the draft that the planning board voted to adopt last night, um, but they have also, I don't even think we said that yet, which is exciting. Um, but uh, there were just two minor amendments that throughout this review process, we looked at making and we are, um, they're just gonna make those two, it's basically adding captions and, and tweaking a map a little bit. Um, so they're gonna make those amendments and then we'll put a final draft or a final version I should say, up on and the website. What, what are you What are you shooting for as as a target date for when you'll have that final master plan completed? Um, well, knowing it's the holiday season, it's a little out of out of scope for the the consultant team. Um, I need to hear back when they're available to make those changes, um, but hopefully within the next two weeks, and get it up by the new by the beginning of the year. And, and to reinforce what Darlene know. said, well. The planning board voted just last night to adopt the plan, to approve and adopt the plan. By state law, that's what is needed for it to become official. So it's okay. now an official master plan. There's not a requirement that the city council take such a vote, but we're gonna present it to them and, and ask them to take an endorsement vote. Again, of the, of the themes, the high level themes of the plan, any potential zoning changes that might uh, come out of the recommendations is a whole different process, which we'll all look forward to undertaking in the coming months and years. I have to say, I did take a quick look through it. It's, a, it's 168 pages. And, and I was just flabbergasted by the amount of detail and how comprehensive that, that plan is. It, it kind of begs the question, uh, looking at that and how many things could be done, how, how would you implement something like that? How would the city prioritize how it's gonna fulfill and, and how it's gonna uh, work out this master plan? Well, we have a couple things in mind, as Mayor's already mentioned, of where we want to start. Um, but I think the first step is um, the planning department is going to take that plan and turn it and, and create a matrix of, of implementation strategies so that we can track it on an annual basis to see where we are and, and, and how we can um, figure out which ones are kind of high, medium, low. And that might change over time, but uh, it's a way to structure it. Um, the Bass River Overlay District certainly for a long time has been one of our top priorities coming out of this plan. Um, and also something that maybe we didn't expect as much was um, looking at the design guidelines and the tall building overlay district and, and maybe um, taking a step back from some of the height that we've uh, allowed in the downtown and looking at a, a way to kind of, you know, revise the, the CC zoning to make it more in line with what we see on the ground. Um, and what the community vision for that area is, both recognizing that Cabot and Rantoul Street have, have very different um, feels. Um, another one, obviously we're working on the climate action plan and the preservation plan has just wrapped up. Um, we've identified an equity audit that I think the, the mayor and I are working on as another priority action item. Um, 
And some of these things kind of fell in our lap too. I think tree planting is one of the strategies and we happen to have the opportunity to apply for a grant this fall for um, to plant um, up to a hundred trees in the city above and beyond what we already do. I think we're gonna, we got the grant for set, the, 75. Um, and so we received that grant from the Regional Planning Council. And so now that we get to go forward on, on that one too. So some of these things we don't necessarily plan to, but an opportunity comes up and we can use the master plan to say, well, this is consistent with, with what the community wants. So let's go after this grant. Now, I know, uh, uh, Mike, you, uh, you asked that I uh, give some time. We're, we're kind of running towards the end of the, the half hour. You, you asked that I give a little bit of time so that you could say something about uh, the, the state of the, you know, how the city is dealing with the COVID uh, pandemic right now, which is certainly on everybody's mind since we've had this incredible upswing, uh, you know, since, since the summer and, and, and predictably now what the experts are telling us is even, even grimmer, uh, you know, grimmer results as we go into the winter. Uh, what would you like to say about that? How has the city been dealing with it? And, what do you see us doing in the next several months? Sure. I don't want to give any numbers really because, you know, we're taping this today. And by the time somebody watches this on one of its rebroadcasts, that, that could be changing. I will say that, you know, we, we like every community in the, in the Commonwealth, have had a significant increase in positive cases day by day, week by week over the last you know, month and a half, two months. Um, we track those numbers daily. I talk with the president of the hospital daily. Um, you know, we track along with them, their capacity. And to date, while they've had significant increases of, of inpatient COVID positive patients, they still have a lot of capacity and that's good today. Um, but I would say this, um, contact tracing has been overwhelmed statewide and overwhelmed here. Uh, if you get 20 new cases or 25 new cases in a day, the public health nurse can't make 25 calls or maybe she can, but even if she's successful in interviewing 25 newly positive patients, if each of them has three or four close contacts that come out of that conversation, how does she then call all those close contacts? Yeah. We've hired on three part-time public health nurses with some CARES money, and we lean on this, the state's community, the contact tracing collaborative for help. But I'm just gonna tell you, it's hard and it doesn't get done comprehensively. So here's some rec a recommendation. If you test positive, or if you know you are a close contact of somebody who's tested positive, and you don't get a call from a contact tracer, please know that you need to isolate if you're positive, and you need to tell the people who you know were close contacts, and we all kind of understand that. Somebody you were within uh, six feet of for 15 minutes or more in a given day, in those two or three days before you started feeling symptoms, or in those two or three days before you tested positive, and if you know you are a close contact, because you know, we all talk with the people we know, and it doesn't mean that everyone's gonna know, but if you know you're a close contact, if you know that you're positive, you need to isolate and quarantine for your own health and, and for the, all the people you care about and interact with. So I think that's a value that, that we can all kind of carry and try to implement. And a second one is um, we know that we should not be spending time indoors with people outside of our family or our household. You know, if you have to be indoors in somebody's presence, make sure you're masked and stay six feet away. Try to have windows open, but don't spend meaningful time indoors with people that aren't in your circle, right? And don't make the mistake of thinking you can keep your circle multiple households because that's how it spreads. So I think, you know, that these are things, they're sacrifices for all of us, but they're important to me. And just know that we're spending time every single day of the week, seven days a week, tracking, listening to experts, working with other communities, working with the governor and his team. And we're trying to make the right decisions. And we're all mindful of, you know, trying to do things as safely as we can, trying to keep our schools open, which have thus far proven to be, you know, a, a safe places, the way we clean them, the way we structure them, the way everybody wears masks. We're doing the best we can and everybody needs to keep doing the best they can you know, the, the, the vaccine's coming, uh, but it won't be out there for everybody until sometime mid to late spring, right? And so we all got to continue to be careful. Um, nobody wants to be a part of being part of somebody getting really sick or dying when we're so close to the other side of this, where we can start to get back to what we're used to. 
So th thanks for giving me a couple minutes on that, Walt. That's, that's very good. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. And uh, we're just about out of time now. So uh, I'd like to thank you, Your Honor, Mike Cahill, our mayor, for, uh, for sharing us the, uh, the master plan, the latest update. And uh, Darlene Wynn, who is the City Director of Planning and Community Development. And congratulations on your, on your new position. Thank you. And I'd like to, uh, to tell our viewers that you've been watching City Scene with Mayor Mike Cahill. I'm your host, Walt Kosmowski. Uh, thank you for watching. Happy holidays. <laughs>